Hi, my name is Haz Kasim. Uh, I'm a pain manage. I'm a pain management physician. I uh, work here in Eisenhower Desert Orthopedic Center. So today we're going to talk about pain and how it affects those of you out there who play golf and uh, tennis. Those of you suffering with low back pain, neck pain, and sometimes even pain that goes down your legs and down your arms, headaches. Pain affects the quality of your life. It affects function. And today there are many different treatments to help those of you in pain. But there's so much out there that it's hard to figure out what is the right treatment for you. In today's talk, we're going to spend some time looking at treatments with that were done in the past, that were done before, and treatments that are done today, and then how pain should be managed in the future and as we go on uh, into a new world with so many different options. So sit back, relax, and enjoy pain management, past, present, and future. Our story begins with this flower. This is the opiate poppy. In the days of the Egyptians and the Greeks, people knew that this bud had special properties. They soon realized that by cutting the flower bud, released a clear white liquid that was kept overnight and it had properties that would reduce pain, make you hallucinate, and uh, it had a variety of different uses. This is a picture published in Le Petit Journal uh, of Paris, 5 July 1903. It shows men and women smoking this opium, which is the white substance that has been solidified and it becomes a black little uh, substance that can be used. People use this throughout uh, Asia, China, the Europe, as well as the United States in opium dens. Smoking opium uh, was a means of controlling pain, a social interaction, and it was something that eventually led to one of the greatest pain management tools out there. Uh, East Asia to Paris, France, London, and even the United States had these opium dens. And opium became, from this point on, the main means of controlling pain of any kind. And that's where we begin our story today, by looking at how pain was managed in the past. Opium is, again, uh, the active compound of these opium poppies. It was powdered into a paste and given to multiple people. This helped significant types of pain. It helped headaches, migraines. And also, if you look at a variety of different pain medications used in the 1800s to the uh, 1920s, 1930s, one of the most active ingredients in it was opium. Sometimes they used alcohol, chloroform, and a lot of different medicines that by today's standard, we would consider not okay in treating pain. This is one of my favorite slides. And if you look right here, this was in the 1880s. Uh, it's cocaine tooth drops for children. So the reason I'm showing you all these slides is, is, is you can see a lot of different treatments that were considered standard of care. Uh, today, we know is not a good option to treat pain. So again, in that time, uh, 1800s, people realized that, you know, cocaine and opium were not the best ways to control pain, and they started looking for more solutions. And a gentleman, uh, a very famous neurologist, James Corning, uh, in 1884, invented the epidural injection. Some of you may have had this. Some of you may have heard of this. It's very different than the type of epidurals you get during childbirth. The same technique, but the idea behind an epidural injection for pain is that it helps reduce spinal pain. So what Dr. Corning did was he took a healthy volunteer, unfortunately a medical student, and injected 101 milligrams of cocaine into his epidural space and anesthetized his uh, spine. Cocaine to this day can be used uh, for bleeding and anesthesia, but obviously not preferred because we have many other agents. Around the same time, x-rays were being developed. A famous physician, scientist actually, Rodigan, uh, received the Nobel Prize in 1901, discovered specific rays. He didn't know what they were called, he called them x-rays. 
But he realized that these rays could take images of structures within our bodies. We didn't have to open the bodies to see them. And this picture you see on the screen is actually his wife's hand. Um, and it's considered the first X-ray ever taken. So as you can see, Corning and Rodigan are developing newer treatment strategies to help people uh, in medical need and in pain. Then the world changed in 1914. The first world war came about. There was a huge toll on human life and a lot of injuries. This was followed by a brief period of peace and then the second world war came about, 1939 to 1945. The Nazis uh, destroyed most of Europe, occupied all the way to France, the Battle of Normandy, storming the beaches. Human toll was significant and people needed true working treatments for pain. This is when they reached back to a small company who in 1827 had gone to that opium poppy and identified the most active compound. They named it after the Greek god Morpheus, the god, god of dreams, and they called it morphine. So in the Second World War and the First World War, every single soldier had an ampule of morphine with him. And what they did was they used this morphine on the battlefields and it was very effective. It helped with pain, it helped with breathing problems. And if people were too far gone, Morphine helped them pass peacefully. As you can see, the world was already changing in the early 1900s. Going from cocaine, heroin, and opium, people were realizing that x-rays, epidural injections, were a better means of controlling pain. Soon the fields of anesthesia developed. The pain management was revolutionized. And in 1827, with the creation of morphine, it really changed medicine. People could now have surgeries because they had a way of controlling pain. They could have longer surgeries, longer procedures. X-rays, again, revolutionized medicine. People could look inside bodies without cutting them open. And epidural injections allowed for regional anesthesia. So already we're seeing the basic building blocks of modern medicine. So from the past mistakes of opium dens and cocaine tooth drops, we move to the present. Now the present world, the success of morphine became revolutionary. Every soldier at the end of Second World War realized the power of morphine. Soon all the pharmaceutical companies jumped on board and developed multitudes of medicines. Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycontin, Oxycodine, Demerol, Dilaudid, Methadone, Fentanyl, developed different means of giving these medicines. You could not only have it injectable, you could have it by mouth, you could have it through the tongue, you could have it IV, you could have it in your epidural space. So the world exploded with these opiates and people started realizing that there may be a problem. Initially, they thought the pain medicines weren't strong enough because the original belief, and this is around the 1950s and 1960s, was that, you know, after a while, if the opiates don't work, increase the dosage. So they started making stronger and stronger opiates. And diamorphine was the last opiate they made that was very potent. But they realized people like to abuse it. So diamorphine's street name is heroin. So heroin is an opiate, like the Vicodins and Percocet pills, that has been abused by people uh, because of certain properties these medicines were going to reveal to the medical community. This was the first article written by the New England Journal of Medicine talking about, hold on a second, these opiates that worked so well in the First and Second World War might be dangerous. This idea that there's no limit, there's no ceiling to these medicines may not be true. So what are the problems with the opiates? And, and, and most of you out there who, who are suffering with pain have probably tried opiates, Vicodin, Percocet. They work really well for acute pain. And acute pain is defined as a pain condition that lasts for less than three months. 
If it lasts longer than that and you're taking a pain medication, the problem is that these drugs cause more pain. The first issue is dependence. That means your body needs these medicines. You can't stop these medicines because um, your body needs them. By the way, this is a picture by Edward Munch. Uh, it's a favorite one of my niece and nephews. And uh, Nala and Zane love this uh, picture. So I thought I'd throw it in there for them. So opiate dependence is a problem because your body needs the medicines and you can't just stop using these medicines. Tolerance, that's another inherent property of these opiates, which means that if you're taking 10 milligrams of oxycodone a day, after a while, it has no effect. Your body gets used to it. That's dangerous because you have to go to higher and higher doses. Abuse, abuse is another problem of these opiate medications where people tend to like them and they overuse them. That leads to addiction. Addiction and abuse are very close. The difference is when people are addicted to these medicines, um, they're willing to break laws and rules to get them. Diversion. Now, this is a big problem in the US. At least it was in the 1980s and the 1990s. A lot of people realized that there was value in these medicines. There was a National Geographic series where cinematographers followed some professional patients who went from clinic to clinic and got these medicines and sold them on the street. So that's how the FDA got involved. That's how all physicians in today's world have a lot of rules before they write any of these opiates. And the final and the most interesting property of uh, opiates, and again, we're talking about Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycodone, Oxycontin, Methadone, Demerol, Dilaudid. All these medicines have something called hyperalgesia. Hyperalgesia means the higher the dose of the opiate, your pain doesn't go down, but it actually gets worse. So this was a challenge in the original idea that if the medicine didn't work, go to a higher dose. And hyperalgesia- so There's a pain guy. Oh yeah, go. So hyperalgesia has been proven uh, multiple times through research. So the question is what's next? We've done pain medicines. We've tried a lot of pain options. So again, in the modern world, people started working on Rodigan's x-rays. What you see right here is a patient laying face down. On the screen in front of you, you see a picture of their spine obtained through that machine. It's an x-ray, but it's mobile. You can move from the top to the bottom. You can take many different angles to look at the spine from many different perspectives. It's called a SIA or a fluoroscopy unit. With that device, people started becoming very specific with treatment. All pain eventually goes through the spinal cord to the brain. So if we can stop pain in the spinal cord, we can prevent it from going to the brain. And that was a theory. We can also treat compressed nerves like this picture. If you look at this picture, you see the L5 nerve root. The L5 is the lumbar five, uh, and that's your low back. The low back has five bones usually, sometimes six, numbered from the top, L1, all the way to the bottom, L5. And if anyone has pain running down their legs or sciatica, a very common treatment is to use the C-arm and put a little cortisone, which is an anti-inflammatory steroid, right next to that pinched nerve. And you can see in the image, the L5 nerve root is highlighted with contrast dye. And this is a procedure that we routinely do for those who have sciatica and it is a very effective option. Now, this is another procedure that's done. And as you can see, again, we're in the lumbar spine, but I've moved my C arm to take a different look, a different perspective. And this is not a direct AP as we call it picture, but an oblique picture where I'm looking at the little joints called facet joints. Facet joints are little joints in your back that help you bend, twist, pick up things. And uh, you know, for those athletes out there, your tennis and golf, all is really dependent on these facet joints. If you have arthritis in the facet joints, unlike in a hip or a knee, uh, we can't really replace these joints because they're so small. You will feel stiffness in your back, difficulty moving, aching in the morning when you wake up. This can happen in your low back, your upper back, and even your neck. 
usually when this happens, we're able to use the fluoroscopy unit again and guide some cortisone, again, the anti-inflammatory steroid into those little joints and reduce the inflammation um, and help people resume function. Again, this uh, is another image of a treatment for arthritis of the SI or sacroiliac joint. Uh, that joint usually gets inflamed uh, when people have surgery in their low back. A lot of the pressure goes to the sacroiliac joints and they develop pain in their very low back. You see my needle in the very tip of the sacroiliac joint and I put a little cortisone uh, into the joint as well. We can see the joint uh, with the help of a contrast dye. And this is a whole different group of injections that we do for those people who have something called complex regional pain syndrome. It's very similar to the type of pain people get after amputations. You might have heard of phantom limb pain. It can happen after amputation of the arm or diabetic foot. In this picture, I again, I'm using my C arm, which is the mobile fluoroscope unit, taking a side picture. We call it a lateral. Using this image, I guide my needle, which is the line uh, across the spinal cord and the vertebral bodies all the way to the very front. And you see that black line in the front of the vertebral bodies. And that is uh, dye showing that I'm on the lumbar sympathetic plexus, which is this group of little baby ganglion who, who help control pain. And we can stop pain in the arms, we can stop migraines, um, and people who have cancer pain receive a lot of these types of injection, especially uh, abdominal cancer. Uh, you know, Patrick Swayze, uh, who had uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, he, 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 abdominal pain is very severe with, uh, you know, that type of cancer. We block the plexus in the T12 that's above the lumbar spine and the thoracic spine, the lower thoracic spine. We lay the patient on the table, guide the needle there. It's a simple five minute procedure uh, with steroids that uh, can reduce the pain significantly. And if they get a lot of benefit from these blockades, we can actually burn those nerves either with something called radio frequency ablation, or we can even put something called phenol, which is a concentrated alcohol um, to these nerves that are very effective. Uh, also, we treat people with tailbone pain, uh, pelvic pain, uh, with different types of injections. And obviously, those who have migraines also get something called a stellate ganglion block, which is in the neck. So as you can see, a lot of different options exist in the present world to treat pain. In addition to all these x-ray guided injections, sometimes people need surgery. And this image is a group of people doing surgery. I work here in uh, Eisenhower Desert Orthopedic Center, and uh, we're part of a spine team. And the advantage of a spine team is, in, uh, is that we have surgeons that know what we do as interventional pain physicians, and we as pain physicians know exactly what they do. So patients get the best outcome because we work so closely with each other, we maximize each other's skill sets and uh, give patients the best options for decreased pain. Because sometimes if a nerve is badly pinched, getting an epidural every two weeks is not a good idea. You do need surgery sometimes. And that's when we call our colleagues up and uh, they help us uh, with reducing pain. Now, in addition to all these different things I've spoken about in the modern world, like I said before, if you open up a magazine, go to the TV on a commercial break, late night TV, you will see so many different things that claim to reduce pain. Magnets, braces, copper wire, uh, and the list goes on. So with all these options out there, have we solved chronic pain? And the answer is no. Today, over 100 million people in the US suffer with chronic pain. It's the number one reason for an emergency room visit, and it costs billions of dollars to help people in pain, not to mention the time off work. And, and, and fundamentally, people are suffering, and there's no way to account for the cost of suffering, pain, and not doing the things you like. 
So why is that? Why do we have so many options today? And why do we still have pain? Why is pain still one of the biggest needs in today's society? That brings us to the future. How should pain be managed to optimize outcome and improve quality of life? Well, one of the big mistakes and misconceptions in treating pain is that everyone's the same. That's not true. Sometimes MRIs and X-rays and spec CTs and EMGs can give us a story, but you need to look at the person in front of you, the patient, and figure out what's causing their pain. It could be a simple thing as position, posture. You could look at an MRI and see a neck full of arthritis and realize that you know, Jill's walking around with a purse that's 50 pounds. And you tell Jill, don't wear that, don't use the purse anymore. And that can solve the problem. So the important thing is looking at individuals rather than the images and looking at a person and finding out what causes their pain. Also, it's very important to treat pain with a comprehensive approach. Medications have a role in treating pain. Opiates, even though I told you all the evil things about opiates, still have a role in treating pain. But it's not a good idea to use opiates long term. But there are muscle relaxants, anti-inflammatories, and all these medicines help. Muscle rehabilitation is a very critical piece when it comes to treating those in pain. For instance, low back. No epidural alone will be successful unless we strengthen the core muscles. The transversalis abdominis, the lowest belt muscle, is a very important muscle to strengthen. Um, we want to strengthen the back muscles. And once we, in, once we inject the spine or once we give somebody medications, there has to be a balance with muscle strengthening. Targeted therapy. And targeted therapy includes a, a whole different groups of group of treatments. Epidurals, facet, sympathetic blocks, all those x-ray guided treatments are an option, but we also have ultrasound, we also have EMG, and all these modalities, all these types of treatments help us guide medicine to very specific areas that we could not have done 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Behavior modification and, and behavior psycho, psycho, psychology. So what that means is, you know, we have, we have an innate understanding of our own bodies. And when we're suffering in pain, it affects the way we feel. And if you're in pain and it makes you feel bad, that's normal. But if you're in pain for a long time, it can lead to depression. So we need to address all these different aspects of pain because if we just treat the pinched nerve and we don't address the person's depression and, and how you feel when you can't pick up your puppy or you can't pick up uh, your grandchild, all these things impact pain because when you're depressed, it makes pain worse and that's a vicious cycle. Also, there is a lot of new alternative treatments that are very effective. For instance, um, Acupuncture, which was considered a joke of medicine about 100 years ago, the New England Journal of Medicine printed an article talking about how sticking little needles in people's bodies doesn't necessarily affect the meridians of the chi as the Chinese originally believed, but what it does is it releases endorphins and changes gene expression. And through these modalities, you can achieve pain relief. And what I've outlined for you here is a comprehensive treatment plan that works well together. And one of the biggest problems in today's treatment, which needs to be changed as we go forward into the future, is utilizing just one or two of these modalities rather than using all these different treatments together based on what people need to help them achieve pain relief. And that's the, that's the reason most treatment plans fail today. You just get an injection or you just get a medication rather than getting the injection to reduce the pain, giving you a window of time when you can strengthen the muscles because a cortisone doesn't last forever. Some people call it a Band-Aid. Sometimes it lasts a lot longer, but during the time your pain is reduced, you can strengthen your muscles much better than you could. And that's the trick. Use all these different treatments to really uh, improve your quality of life. 
And based on these theories, a lot of different uh, hospital groups have created pain centers or spine centers where different specialties work together and, and share their skills. A surgeon knows things about the spine from a surgical lens or surgical view. I know things about the spine from a minimally invasive lens. And, and sometimes these two worlds don't combine. You know, surgery is getting a lot of better outcomes nowadays because of what we do in the world of interventional pain in helping identify the problem. And uh, that's the advantage of a spine center and a pain center. And, and it's certainly a privilege uh, to be one of the, I think it is the only spine center here in Coachella Valley um, with the, my colleagues, uh, Jeff Smith, uh, Kevin Wong, David Tahoney, and Fei Su. Uh, we really are able to maximize uh, outcomes for patients. Now, as I talk about the future, I think it wouldn't be fair if I don't mention some of the latest and greatest things out there. It all begins with really understanding pain. All right? Pain is very complicated. So what I'm going to show you here is a little video of what really happens when people have pain. Books have been written about this. Institutions have been created just to research pain. People originally thought that pain was an imbalance of the humors in the days of Aristotle. And then we realized that there's actually a road that connects the pain, any part of your body, to the brain. And if you look closely at this image, I'm going to break down many, many textbooks and many institutions' research here, just so that we all understand the complexity of what's happening. So here's a guy. He's getting a needle stick. And what happens is that there are little receptors under the skin. This is called nociceptors. Now, the nociceptors are specialized receptors only for pain. So of all the receptors in your body, receptors specially for pain. These nociceptors respond to any type of painful stimulation, like a hot pot, chemical stimulation, or anything that's unpleasant. And that, by the way, is the definition of pain. Pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory experience and an emotional experience. So it's not only an awful feeling, a painful feeling, but it also affects your emotion. So it's a combination of sensation and emotion that's negative. So after this re receptors are depolarized, as we call them, the pain signal travels all the way through the body, through the single nerve fibers, collecting more fibers as it goes deeper and deeper into your spinal cord. It enters into the posterior aspect or the back of the spinal cord in an area that we call the dorsal horn. Uh, this is a image of what we call a cross section. Um, and you can see the spinal cord. That's the stuff that looks like the butterfly surrounded by all the nerve, uh, uh, nerve tracts that talk to each other and go to the brain. The ventral horn is how information goes out of the spinal cord. And the signal goes to the spinal cord and it goes across and joins a bigger pathway that it goes to the brain. So the spinal cord and the brain essentially regulate or modulate the way we feel and perceive pain. That's why it's very important to use this comprehensive plan to work on the muscles so that when we're activating the nociceptors in the, in the skin, that we are able to reduce the threshold when they fire. It's important to take the right medicines, reduce the right stimulation with the injections and, and change emotion too. All these things change the way your body perceives pain. So using all these theories, you know, we have developed a lot of sophisticated tools to deliver medicines to specific areas. You see this gentleman here, he's using a fluoroscope, which is the uh, original machine uh, that I showed you to look at x-rays, but he also has an ultrasound machine right there that's looking at the muscle. So the ultrasound is very useful because it allows us to look at muscle fibers. X-rays only allow us to look at the bony structure, which is really what we need when we're doing uh, spinal injections. But we can look at both in this uh, instance. So this is an ultrasound guided shoulder injection. 
Um, and the second picture down there is an EMG guided muscle injection. For instance, if people have spasticity or spasms, and it can happen after a stroke or if you have a condition like cerebral palsy, using the EMG machine, we're able to put the medicines into the muscles that need it the most. So again, this technology helps us to do what's called targeted therapy. And this is a group of treatments that are getting very popular now. It's called spinal cord stimulation. So in addition to all the localized treatments that we perform where we can go in and do epidural sympathetic blocks, one concept is why don't we just block anything going past the spinal cord? And that's how the idea of spinal cord stimulation developed. You see those two rail track like devices, those are two wires. Each of those black dots are electrodes. We put it right on top of the epidural space by uh, inserting the wires in using a live x-ray machine. And by live, I mean, I, I just take some continuous x-rays, see the wires go to that spot and place it. And that little line across the bottom is my needle that helps me identify the level. And that level is T12 or thoracic 12. I know that because there's a rib coming out of that. When you go from the lumbar spine to the thoracic, you see the ribs. What these electrodes do um, is that they emit electrical current that, be, that can be controlled via Bluetooth. So I'll, uh, I'll have a handheld Bluetooth device that's connected to these. I can change the programming on these uh, electrodes and they block any pain signals that are growing to the brain. This can be used for people who have failed back syndrome, meaning they've had surgery and still have pain. People who have a phantom limb pain, chronic pain, um, paralysis, a lot of different things uh, are, are, are controlled through these uh, devices. And in the modern world, we have actually made so many changes to spinal cord stimulation. This was a study that I published in the Spinal Modulation Journal. It was called the Accurate Trial. What we did was we put the device actually outside of the epidural space in something called the DRG. This is the basis of Abbott's uh, DRG uh, spinal cord stimulation. Specifically, this treatment can control very small areas of pain. So if somebody has pain from a inguinal hernia, knee pain that has failed surgery, ankle pain, I could put a single little wire on a specific nerve that goes to that area and prevent the pain signal from going to the brain. You can see the difference in the technique. On the right side is what we call conventional stimulation. On the left side is the DRG or dorsal root ganglion. So again, what I'm pointing out is in the, in the modern world, there's a lot of changes, a lot of sophistication to this. And that has gotten even more complex. We have different patterns of stimulation, burst stimulation traditional therapy versus what they call HF10. HF10 is a different type of treatment with high frequency stimulation. Also a lot of different changes in terms of positioning. Spinal cord stimulation can account for sitting, standing, bending and deliver the same amount of uh, electrical current. This is another device that we use sometimes. It's a pain pump. It's the size of a hockey puck. Uh, we surgically implant it. I make a little incision in the middle of the back. I put a little catheter, which is a, which is a tube. Looks kind of like a little straw, kind of like this, uh, much thinner. But I put that catheter into the spinal fluid. And then I connect it to the hockey puck, which I put in the lower back. And again, it's a very small incision, two little incisions. And, and this hockey puck has pain medicines. And we spoke about pain meds and said they were evil, but they're not evil. These meds have a role in the right situation. Here, what we do now is something called microdosing, meaning people will get very small doses of dilaudid or morphine that goes directly to the spinal fluid. The advantage of that is you don't have a lot of those side effects because it's going directly to the nerves in the spinal fluid. It helps a variety of different pain conditions. Sometimes uh, when people have strokes and spasticity, this is used to deliver other types of medicines like baclofen that can reduce the tension in the muscles. And here's another advanced therapy that's getting uh, very popular. It's called an ablation. Uh, remember we spoke about the arthritis in the back and how I would do a facet joint injection if people had pain and arthritis. Because in the back, 
we can't do a replacement of the joint like we would for a knee or a hip. Now, this is another technique that we use where we burn the nerves around the joint. And it's called an ablation where we pretty much dissolve them. Uh, and these are little nerves that do nothing. It's like an appendix. They do nothing but, uh, but cause problems. So by dissolving these nerves, we can give people benefit for six months or two years. And this is an image of the needles right next to those nerves that we burn. We can do this in the back, neck, knee, uh, and in Europe, they're doing it in the hip and shoulder joints as well. This is a newer needle. It's called a venom needle. Uh, cool name. But uh, what it does is it just burns the nerves with this two-prong type needle. Also, something getting very popular that you've heard about recently is, is PRP, platelet-rich plasma. This falls under a newer group of treatments called biologics. Biologics are using your own body's substances to treat pain. So the idea behind PRP is that we collect your blood. Okay, you come to the office, we sit you down, we collect your blood. We put it in a machine that spins it. That spins it into three different pieces. One of those little pieces is, are the platelets. Then we take the platelets and we put it in the affected area. It could be a shoulder, a hip, a muscle. What we're doing is tricking the body to send healing molecules there. Because if you cut your hand and it bleeds, the bleeding stops. The reason for that is the platelets. And then there's a little swelling because the platelets have recruited a lot of different compounds that help reduce pain. And that's the idea behind platelet-rich plasma. We put it in a variety of different areas in your body and we can help with pain. Now, obviously there's a lot of talk about stem cell. What is this stem cell, right? So the idea behind stem cell is that we can put in stel cells that can grow up to become healing normal cells in an area that's damaged. It's a little controversial if we have the right type of cells. For instance, these cells can be taken from fat, abdominal fat. It can be taken from the iliac crest, which is in the back here, or, or your bone. And the idea is to take these cells and put them into different areas of your body. There are a lot of institutions here that not in, in the US that do whole different types of stem cells. They inject it in facet joints in the epidural space. The only problem is we don't have a lot of evidence as to how they do. And there's a lot of bad stuff going out as well with people just doing these because they have become a very financial and, and a very lucrative type of uh, treatment, and, and, and that's something that needs to be uh, of concern. In the future, though, if this technique and treatment was perfected, we could take some stem cells, put them in bad facet joints, and have them heal and regenerate. We could put it in a disc that's protruding out, have it heal and regenerate. We could put it in a knee that has arthritis, have it heal and regenerate. We're not there yet, but in the future. So I go back to my journal, Le Petit Journal, 5 July, 1903. The opium den that was popularized in the 1800s and the late 1900s. We have come a long way from these days. We have come a long way in terms of what we know about pain, how we treat pain, but we still have problems. And if we look at what was done in the past, all the old ways of doing it, some of those ideas are still lingering on in the present. People still believe in high dose of opiates. People still believe in using treatments in isolation rather than a group. But what we need to do is maximize all our present treatments so that we can go into the future. Learn from the past, live in the present, believe in the future. Thank you. <laughs>